I am presenting how a communication satellite uh, systems engineering the approach is made. Actually, today happens to be the 27th. The 19th was observed as a satellite technology day. It would have been appropriate if we had the, this talk on 19th April. It doesn't matter. Now, in my presentation contents, I'm going to talk about the different satellites, geostationary satellites. I am confining to geostationary satellites and the under geostationary satellites, I am going to talk only about the communication satellite. There are various possibilities. And uh, the platform system description and the choice of payloads for meeting the service requirement and building the satellite around the payload and the designing the satellite for the space environment, sequence of realization and confusion. Now there are so many geo satellites. Of course, apart from geo satellites, there are Leo satellites, low earth orbiting satellites, and neo satellites, medium earth orbiting satellites. The types of geo satellites itself is the communication satellite. We have purely a weather monitoring and weather data relay satellite. We have multi-purpose satellite, which is a combination of communication as well as meteorological services satellite. A mobile communication satellite with a very large unfurlable antenna to give the high radiating power from the satellite so that it is possible to have communication when the ground station is mobile. Then we have the imaging satellites from the geostationary orbit where continuous imaging is possible of a particular place. Then we have the navigation satellites. We also have the spinners and the free access stabilized satellites in geostationary orbit. And out of all these satellites, my talk today confines to a communication satellite from geostationary orbit. Of course, you might have heard about uh, Starlink one wave satellites, which are low earth orbiting and neo satellites used for communication, that too, high throughput communication satellites. That is a different technology altogether. And it's also, also the satellite is quite, quite compact and quite low weight as compared to what I am going to discuss now. Now let us see, but irrespective of that, the basic building block, the basic technology remains the same. Let us see what is a satellite is made of. Satellite has to have a payload, a communication or a meteorology or a remote sensing or a multiplication or whatever it is. And there should be a supporting platform systems. What we call as platform systems is the structure to accommodate the payload, the mechanisms for handling the solar panel, the antennas, etc. The thermal management, the propulsion to give the life to the spacecraft, attitude and orbit control along with the sensors to maintain the orbit and attitude of the satellite, power generation, power distribution, power storage, comprises the electrical power systems. Then you need to monitor the health of the satellites and also you need to command the satellite. Therefore, you need to have the telemetry telecommand subsystems. These constitute on the right side the platform systems to support the payload operations. So, spacecraft structures provides a stable interface for the payload as well as the deployables. Uh, there, there can be a 500 kg or 350 kg small satellites to 6000 kg large satellites. And uh, the, as I told, it accommodates the payload and it meets the strength and stiffness requirements which is necessary for the withstanding the launch environment. And it, the structure provides the interface between the launcher and the satellite. And it's, it has to sustain the launch loads, shock and vibration during various mission phases. And 
it has to be electrically conductive to serve as a common grounding point for all the electrical equipments. This is one structure with a central cylinder with the equipment panels. It, it is made of aluminium in the earlier days. Now it, it then migrated to a mix of aluminium and fiber plastics, carbon fiber reinforced plastics. Then came the lightweight complete carbon fiber reinforced plastics or glass fiber reinforced plastics. Otherwise, wherever there is high dissipation, the equipment panels are mostly aluminium honeycomb with face skins, metallic face skins. This is another view of another structure uh, with the equipment panels and the supporting frames and all that. This is a typical two, one small satellite on a very large satellite spacecraft structure which ISRO has made with all the solar panels, reflectors and the antennas etc. And the spacecraft mechanisms, there are several large surfaces which are to be folded during launch and to be deployed once it, the satellite reaches on orbit condition and such deployment is possible through the deployment mechanisms. The deployables are like the solar panels or payload antennas, unfurlable antennas, solar flaps, thermal radiator panels, etc. These deployment panels are torsion spring loaded and motorized operation for lockdown for deployment and lockdown. Critical parameters governing the design of the mechanisms is stability during maneuvers, pointing accurate pointing requirements, align, high alignment, withstanding deployment and latch of conditions. The thermal control is to maintain the temperatures of all subsystems and all external environments I will talk about the external environments in my later slides. Under all operating modes, the payloads may be switched off, the payloads may be operating in full power mode or at a reduced power level. The nominal temperature for electronics is 0 to 40 degrees, for batteries it is 0 to 12 degrees and propulsion systems should withstand, can withstand only between minus 10 and plus 50 degrees. Under, under thermal control, wherever there is a heat generation point and the heat transfer is by conduction and then it is radiated to outside atmosphere, outside yeah, space, radiation through to the space. There is no convection because there is no atmosphere. Thermal control is either by heat sinks or thermal heat pipes. Optical solar reflectors for radiation to outer space. And protection from the outer space to the inside equipment is through insulation blankets. And heaters in case the spacecraft goes into uh, the tips conditions the temperature will fall down very low, so you require heaters to maintain the temperatures. So, there can be OSRs, there can be thermal blankets, there can be heaters, there can be foil heaters, heat pipes, all these things constitute the thermal control. Now, the propulsion system. Propulsion system is required for raising the satellites from Earth to the required orbit and to once it reaches the orbital slot, it has to maintain its station keeping given attitude. So station keeping is an important aspect which is maintained by the propulsion system. You can use either chemical propulsion or electrical propulsion. Under chemical propulsion, you have monopropellant, you have bipropellant. Monopropellant can be simply hydrazine with a pressurant. Bipropellant can be monomethyl hydrazine and along with an oxidizer and a pressurant. Pressurant is used for pushing the either the pressurant and either the 
uh, oxidizer or the propellant. Pressurant is for that. The pressurant is usually in inert gas like helium, and the various components of the propulsion system can be tanks for storing the fuel and oxidizer, pressurant tank. Pressure regulators, pressure transducers for measuring the pressure and delimiting to the ground, latch walls, filters, and heavy duty thrusters and small duty thrusters. Tanks are for storing the oxidizer, fuel, pressure and tank, etc. Tankage can be from 30 liters to 1200 liters. It is made of titanium tanks and the system is based on chemical engineering, hydraulics and pneumatics. Various uh, valves, filters, transducers, engines are used as per the system requirement. And propulsion will have uh, a large impact on the life of the spacecraft and propulsion system sizing depends on the appropriate payload mass as well as the resultant uh, spacecraft mass. Electric propulsion is possible uh, by use of electrostatic or electromagnetic fields to accelerate a given uh, neutral gas like xenon or argon to achieve high speeds and thus generate thrust to modify the velocity of a spacecraft in orbit. Ion thrusters or plasma thrusters, of course. The electric propulsion results in a lower specific impulse as against a higher specific impulse of a chemical propulsion, but still, but it, its life can be much, much longer. And it may require a larger time for achieving the orbit. The total spacecraft mass is very much less, less when you come when you use the electric propulsion as compared to the chemical propulsion. The power system of a spacecraft comprises of power generation using solar panels, power storage using batteries and power distribution using electronics and the logical circuits. The, the solar arrays can be made out of either silicon or gallium arsenide, or triple junction, advanced triple junction, and uh, ITJs. The efficiency from the silicon cells to gallium arsenide to the triple junctions have increased quite considerably. The mass density per kilogram is also on the higher side. The power generation capacity is highest in the triple junction cells. The solar panel area is calculated as the power required for the operating of the spacecraft and power generating capability is the total area. The mass thumb rule is mass is equal to area into mass density. This is the construction of a triple junction solar cells. So solar radiation, the photovoltaic effect gives rise to electrical energy which goes to get stored in the batteries. Batteries again can be in the olden days nickel cadmium, then we migrated to nickel hydrogen. Today mostly all the batteries used on the spacecraft are lithium ion and they are the highest energy density ratios that lithium ion is the highest number and also the mass is also the lowest much lower the, the evaluation the evolution of the lithium ion has resulted in a very low battery mass the allowed depth of discharge of course remains more or less same in all the technologies in leo and allowed depth of discharge in geo is much better in lithium ion. So the battery mass for 1000 watts of active support is the lowest in lithium ion. Therefore, lithium ion has come to stay 
as the standard battery technology to be used in the spacecrafts. The power management is done in the power electronic systems where there is voltage regulation. Uh, you may generate, uh, the voltage should not fluctuate. You may generate the power from the solar array, but you have to regulate the voltage and the power distribution that is carried out in the power electronics. It uses various logics. It also has the telemetry and telecommand interfaces. And uh, the pres presently, most of the spacecraft uses high voltage bus so that the current through the harness is minimal. 70 volts is the acceptable. Sometimes spacecraft are using even 140 watts, 140 volts, 140 volts power bus. A solar array drive assembly is required because the satellite is constantly looking at the earth for its communication services, whereas the solar array is tracking the sun for maximum power generation, therefore the solar panels are rotating, whereas the spacecraft body is stationary, and therefore the power from the rotating solar panel has to go through what is called as a solar array drive assembly. It consists of a rotor through which the power harness is passed through a yeah, very low resistance power as well as signal slip rings. The, the drive mechanism is driven by the solar panel power sensor, solar panel sun sensor mounted on the solar panel or it is also driven by the clock pulses from the control system, control electronics. So the attitude and orbit control, uh, it's required during precise attitude holding during orbit racing, keeping the satellite body aligned during approach, thruster firing. During on-orbit conditions, what happens is there will be atmospheric drag, there will be solar wind disturbances, radiation pressures, and the magnetic field interactions, reactive forces, due to moving components within the satellites. All these things produces small amount of disturbances on the spacecraft, which requires, which disturbs the attitude of the spacecraft. This requires correction very frequently, and the attitude control system does the same thing. It, it has a central uh, computer to which you have the sensors, like the air sensors, sun sensors, or the star sensors, or the gyros, all this sensor information is fed to it, which is then used to assess the attitude of the spacecraft. And if there is any error with respect to the required attitude, a corrective force is applied through a talking mechanism. Talking mechanisms can be a wheel, wheel speed, or it can be a magnetic torquer, or it can be a solar array drive, a combination of all these things, or it can be the thrusters, even through the thrusters, a small pulsing of the thrusters will, will correct the attitude of the spacecraft. If you have a very narrow beam antenna pointing, it requires much better beam pointing and therefore a closed loop antenna tracking with a jimbold antenna is employed. And the reference for this closed loop antenna tracking is through a beacon from the ground. And the pointing accuracy which one can achieve in the beacon based pointing accuracy is plus minus 0.03 as against the electronic onboard electronics based AOCS pointing, which is almost five times. You have the telemetry and telecommand systems for gathering all the sensors information on board the satellite, multiplexing the converting from the analog uh, sensor outputs to the digital uh, media, digital format, digital data multiplex them, process them, <coughs> then uh, you have to arrange it in the form of a framed structure, 
modulate it and transmit it through the PTC antenna to the ground. The ground receives it, demodulates it from the RF to the baseband, and then the bit synchronization and frame synchronization happens, and then the the scripted bits are constructed to form the elementary information about various subsystems and displayed on computer screens. This is how the telemetry works. The RF link works in PCM PM mode. Similarly, it is the uplink for the telecommanding of the spacecraft from the ground. Encoder, a modulator, a transmitter, transmitting towards the spacecraft, which is received through an Omni antenna. The Omni antenna connects to the demodulator and receiver. Then it is decoded. From the decoder, the distribution circuitry sends it to the various subsystems for operating the valves or switches or whatever it is. There are various types of commands like simple on off commands to tag the commands, execute after verification commands, remote program basic based commanding. Similarly, for telemetry, voltages, currents, pressures speeds of moving equipment, deployment latching status, we have normal real-time telemetry, well telemetry, and sometimes on board the telemetry gets stored and forwarded to the ground to be read at a later date when there is a visibility of the satellite. There are various deployables which we have seen, all of them uses composite elements and this is the physical configuration of one of our ISRO satellites where equipment panels, the solar panels, the deployable reflectors, the propellant tanks, the lamp engine, everything is shown here. And this shows how the satellite is built. The EV panel with the EV mounted antenna, the anti-earth viewing deck the north and south panel assembly, the small equipment panel assemblies on the north and south sides, the battery assemblies, battery deck assembly, the stiffening east and west panels, and the solar arrays getting assembled, and the reflectors getting hinged to the east and west panels, and that's how the satellite assembly takes place. We have very quickly reviewed the spacecraft support system. Let us now see the payload. So, payloads are used for various communication applications like the telecommunications, business communications, VSATs, <coughs> broadcasting of television and radio, internet services, search and rescue, disaster management, navigation, data transmission as part of the meteorological data and also data transmission as part of a remote sensing data. The various frequencies from UHF to KM band is used. KM band is 400 megahertz to 30 gigahertz. And the payload performance parameters is defined by the type of service to be provided like telephone service or data service or TV service and what frequency is coordinated through the ITU and the service area definition, we have India coverage beams, we have India plus the island coverage, we have the entire Asian coverage, we have the global coverage, all these things. What is the service quality? <coughs> service quality is defined by the equivalent isotropic radiated power, EIRP, the various technologies available to be used for the power amplifiers like TWPS, SSPS, or the antennas and any switching requirement on board and the reliability requirement based on the what is the uh, availability and reliability specified and mission like requirement like uh, whether you want a 7 years mission spacecraft or a 15 years mission spacecraft. The satellite EIRP to be provided depends on the service area, type of service, the government size. For a telecom service is typically 36 to 38 dBW. For a DTH service like a television service, 48 to 52 dBW. Video distribution, it is about 40 dBW. 
for high speed data links it is 55 net dbw or even more than that so depending on the service area and the type of service one has to choose either sspa or ewpa and also depends on the figure of merit merit of the entire payload systems that again is decided by the frequency coordinated and frequency band to be used typically uplink is received through an antenna there is a repeater which can be a passive repeater or, or an active repeater and then the downlink through the same antenna or another antenna and the what i showed as the repeater this is some expansion of that repeater like the input filter output filter there is a mixer for frequency conversion and then a medium power and a high power amplifier before retransmission for re and reconnect if there is a reprocessing then it becomes an active transponder with the redundancies with multiple channels this the payload becomes a bit more complex as it is shown here that there are various types of antennas like parabolic reflectors center fed offset fed cassegrain reflectors dual grid for polarization discrimination that means you can use one set of reflector for both transmit and receive shaped reflector and shaped reflectors multiple feed multi beam forming networks phase arrays planar arrays so many varieties are there as for example i have shown here a shaped india beam and unshaped coverage global coverage multi beam spot beam and now expanded coverage expanded asian coverage covering from middle east to southeast asian countries all these are possible through the use of various types of reflectors and the configuration of the satellite the payload technology as i told again the sspas twps cavity filters one can use uh, the cavity actual cavity filter or dielectric filters which are very mass efficient uh, if the reflectors can be fixed mounted or deployable and multiple beam antennas beam steering is possible when you launch a satellite uh, with a service area or say middle east and then you beam steer so that the service area is shifted to southeast asian countries like that all these technologies what is the service requirement it all depends on that and therefore the payload definition payload configuration then the spacecraft configuration and then the design for the spacecraft environment let us see the service required communication transponders what are the frequency bands whether what are the services like weather data search and rescue whether to be included what is the requirement of the power range of coverage power what is the coverage area what is the g by t that is the figure of merit of the transponder what is the pointing requirements do we have the coordination and regulatory aspects fulfilled like orbital slot frequency coordination power spectral density power flux density what are the technologies to be employed all these things are the inputs which goes to define the payload configuration and then comes the spacecraft system payload configuration inputs power requirements launch vehicle aspects spacecraft platform stabilization and control scheme mechanical and thermal aspects of the payload assembly and integration and testing of the payload on orbit life and mission requirements all these factors govern the spacecraft configuration so once the payload is configured based on the service requirements you get the payload layout you get the antennas and their sizes you get the payload volume you get the payload power you get to know how the payload has to be operated during active periods what is the total thermal dissipation what are all the telemetry parameters of the payload you wanted to monitor what are the commanding requirements of the payload hardware any other specific support requirements and therefore you define the satellite size and volume equipment panel size to accommodate accommodate the payload whether you can use heat pipes 
or without heat pipes you can manage the thermal management whether you require external thermal radiation area or only the equipment panel size can accommodate all the optical solar reflectors and what is the type of antenna required fixed or deployable antennas then the power, for the power requirement of, to meet the power demands of the payload what will be the solar array sizing what is the payload power requirement what is the platform power requirement what is the solar array size choice of cell technology to optimize the solar array size as well as the mass choice of battery cell capacity to minimize the area of mass and of course telemetry telecommanding location of the ptc antenna studying the control system capability to handle the antenna pointing needs then the propulsion loading calculation to meet the life requirements you in my required the satellite to be operated for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years accordingly what is the propulsion loading requirement propellant tank sizing leading to the accommodation of the stadium to spacecraft volume the final decision on the spacecraft bus whether it is a small satellite or a medium satellite or a large satellite and the categorize, categorization of the spacecraft as a 2 kilowatts to 10 kilowatts satellite and the payload fairing there are so many types of payload fairing, fair, fairings available you have a 3.2 meter PSLV XL on which a geostationary satellite can be launched up to a mass of 1400 kg you have the GSLV Mark II which is a 4 meter fairing so, a diameter of 4 meters is available for accommodating the entire spacecraft. We have the GSLV Mark III with a 5 meter payload fairing. And we have the Arian 5. Of course, Arian 5 is now obsolete. It also has Arian 5 meter fairing. Arian 5 is now replaced with Arian 6. The launch masses also varies from uh, 2400 kg of GSLV Mark II to 4400 kg of Mark III and 10,000 kg in dual launch mode for Arian. In summary, the payload accommodation physical size must fit on the spacecraft platform compatibility with launch vehicle fairing, specifically deployables like reflectors, solar arrays, the ability to, of the spacecraft to conduct and radiate the heat available radiated area of the spacecraft, mass of thermal control hardware, impact on the power budget, payload mass, impacts on the dry mass, propellant mass, spacecraft life, cost for a transponder, power consumption, sunlit power generation, eclipse support, overall power of the spacecraft, power systems and power distribution, TMPC requirements. So that is how we go ahead with the configuration of the spacecraft starting from the spacecraft the payload, payload service requirements and the payloads and the supporting platform system requirement. How this satellite design activity is done is through the architecture, mechanical architecture the launcher road, stiffness dimensions, geometry, views, angles, radiative area of various sensors, launcher interface, thermal, limits for mission and life, other things like conductivity, radiation protection, protection, radiation protection and propulsion. And then also in the electrical architecture, like uh, feasibility of easy integration and disintegration control systems, power generation, storage, distribution, telemetry, telecommand accommodation and the PTC antenna accommodation, data management, handling of onboard processing storage, etc. And the other system aspects like optimized mass and power mass properties of the entire spacecraft, maximum cubic space utility, optimal power usage, EMI, electromagnetic interference and electrostatic discharge studies, increased reliability, integration convenience, enhanced autonomy, onboard autonomy, time frame that is scheduled, cost reduction, etc. All these things are not done by 
some of them are done by human intervention by human uh, manly evaluation most of them are done through software tools like cadence and soft micro office and matlab catia nasfam ideas unigraphs or cad fast track so many uh, software modules are available for carrying out different uh, uh, works of the space of design configuration design also we have talked about the physical electrical configuration of the satellite and design of the satellites accommodation of the payloads platform systems how to assemble the spacecraft but uh, we have to keep in mind that the spacecraft has to be designed for the space environment and uh, the space environment during launch and ascent during in orbit operation and also during the ground handling during transportation to various facilities whereas on the earth the earth atmosphere gives a very congenial environment within tolerable limits with respect to temperature g level there is no radiation and easily accessibility for inspection and repair but these facilities are not available once you launch it in the space the space craft has to survive severe launch loads deep pressurization during ascent phase and during the ascent phase there will be a thermal load which will be changing with the time and the design has to take care of the mechanical design has to take care of the stress dynamic loads during the ascent phase acoustic loads when it is traveling through the atmospheric media shock loads micro vibration and fatigue and with respect to temperature once it reaches this orbit the solar flux density on the earth is 500 watts per meter square whereas in space it's almost three times the earth's surface is 293 degree kelvin whereas once the space of sees the core space it sees 4 degree kelvin therefore on one side the thermal input is very high on the other side when the space not sees the cold space it sees a very low temperature and there is no convection everything has to be through radiation conduction inside the space not and radiation the temperature variations can be as worst as minus 272 plus 130 degrees in the space this is only around the space only around the earth at about 36000 km altitude whereas the thermal requirements for all the subsystems is electronically electronics is typically minus 10 to 40 batteries minus 5 to 15 hydrogen is plus 9 to plus 40 and the thermal gradients has to be low minimize thermal gradients provide thermal stability it should provide a, the space of thermal design should provide a stable thermal stability and distortion thermal related distortion particularly on the reflectors should be minimal i just want to check are you able to hear and see the hear me and see the um, the slides yes sir thank you thank you so uh, so the thermal testing is done on the earth to simulate the worst case thermal environment in space and to validate the thermal design before launching verify the thermal design verify the predicted temperature extremes verify proper functioning of the equipment under thermal vacuum conditions and also verify the total thermal environment effects on the various subsystems and the in in the space like on the earth where we are protected by the atmosphere there is atomic oxygen high energy electromagnetic radiation uh, during due to various reasons like the sunspot activity particle radiation there can be various floating debris like micro meteorites etc plus you have also the plume impingements plume impingements from the various thrusters and uh, uh, engine firings etc plasma of charged particles like protons electrons heavy ionized atoms 
with a velocity of 450 kilometers per second is very typical. <coughs> what happens is all these things get deposited at various locations. It can accumulate electrostatic charging and when the voltage build up across a small distances is enough, it will result in electrostatic discharge. When the electrostatic discharge can give rise to electromagnetic uh, waves and that causes electromagnetic inter interference, interactions and interference. So, to prevent the effect of all these things, it requires uh, hardening of the electronics design against was it what is called as single event upset and set Sing, single event transients the, this is a very important aspect of grounding also you have to provide appropriate, appropriate grounding you have to identify places where electrostatic charging can take place provide grounding so that its negative effects are minimized. There can be contamination effects like outgassing of materials. Some materials can sublimate, combustion plumes, contamination deposit on sensitive surfaces like sensors, material selection. So we know in spacecraft what is called as standardized parts and materials. Only we have to select from them. Special adhesives, lubricants with acceptable total mass loss, condensable volume, mass, all these things has to be very carefully selected. So, spacecraft, this is how the spacecraft has to be designed against all these environments, environments like mechanical environment, electrical environment, radiation environment, contamination effects, plume effects, all these things. Spacecraft realization sequence. Broad flow of spacecraft AAT activities. The structure arrives, propulsion integration takes place, then the various subsystems are built at the various design centers like telemetry, telecommand, power, payloads, control systems, propulsion, etc. They are independently built, tested, and delivered. Then the payload delivery happens, spacecraft assembly. And the entire spacecraft is assembled and closed. Spacecraft thermovacuum test is done. Then post thermovac functional test is done. The post thermovac functional test will ensure that the thermovac effects is not deteriorating the performance of the various subsystems. Appendage integration means the antenna, deployable reflectors, the solar array, deployable solar arrays etc. Deployment and uh, various external propulsion equipments or like thrusters are all added, the sensors are added, TTC antennas which is external to the spacecraft is mounted and the deployment wherever is necessary in orbit, it is done on the ground and to check the alignments. And completion of thermal propulsion activities external to the spacecraft, dynamic tests like vibration, which will be prevalent during ascent phase acoustics, and then the post dynamic functional checks of all subsystems spacecraft, RF test in the compact antenna test facility, the radiative mode. This is made mostly for the payloads, and the spacecraft is made ready for shipment to launch base. It is encapsulated and transported either by road or through air. I have shown some schematic figures. These are all actual figures, either by road or by air. Some others also do the shipping by sea. And once it reaches the launch base, the spacecraft is tested for the ground transport or air transport or the sea transport effect to overcome the, to see that there is no negative effects one quick functional test is done then the propellant is loaded in the spacecraft only at the launch base before it is integrated it is melted with the rocket then the assembly to <coughs> the rocket adapter which is a conical structure at the bottom 
launch, that is called as launch vehicle adapter. Then it is encapsulated in the heat shield. This is part of the rocket assembly. In the fully assembled spacecraft is sent to the launch pad. It is ready for launch. And the lift off. Finally, once the date and time has decided that the mission sequence is arrived, the launch takes place. The launch vehicle inserts a satellite into a geostationary transfer orbit from where it is lifted further to the geostationary stationary orbit. It is done using the lamp firings or the thruster firings. It is positioned at the desired coordinated orbital slot and the payload operations becomes possible. And that is the, this is the last slide. Therefore, in conclusion, the SATCOM system is an integration of the multidisciplinary knowledge of science and engineering, whether it is propulsion engineering or materials engineering or the digital engineering or the communication engineering or whatever it is, or the structural engineering, whatever it is. The SATCOM design involves a structured design and development process considering various requirements which could be sometimes conflicting in nature. Choices between technological options, the end product and the end application in mind, and which includes high reliability, a zero error and high reliability. So satellite systems engineering is one attractive and satisfying field which is very fulfilling and this is where this is the field in which i was working thank you very much